So for our last panel, folks, uh, and thanks for bearing, joining us today and uh, going on this, uh, this journey for this discussion, um, our last panel is going to be one that really sort of takes it home. Again, take, brings it here to Wyoming, um, the, the home state for Jackson Hole, where we're, where we're based out of. And you know, Wyoming, the nation's largest producer of coal, plays a central role as it relates to climate change. The topic of climate change, a really big topic in, in Wyoming for that reason. It's also a state where we're an energy producing state and uh, we have a large voice as it relates to how the nation's uh, energy policy decisions are made. So this next panel is going to dig into what creating a resilient Wyoming can look like. And these are very live discussions that are happening in Wyoming all the time. Where are the new jobs gonna come from? What are the economic trade-offs that need to be made? And uh, we really have a fantastic panel that's gonna dig into some of these uh, topics and it's going to be led by um, our good friend here at the Jacksonville Center for Global Affairs, Phil Cameron, who's the Executive Director of Energy Conservation Works. Phil has, and uh, Energy Conservation Works is a local entity that really it takes the lead in um, uh, scaling up renewable energy projects, and Phil will probably talk about some of the other work that they do. Phil has spent more than a dozen years working on sustainability and energy issues in the greater Yellowstone region. A resident of Wyoming for nearly 20 years as Energy Conservation Works Executive Director since 2014, Phil oversees all aspects of Energy Conservation Works, serving the community broadly to invest in energy conservation, efficiency, clean energy, and clean transportation projects. Phil previously served as the executive director of Yellowstone Teton Clean Cities, during which time the Department of Energy recognized Phil as a rising star in the National Clean Cities Program for his work on clean transportation projects across Grand Teton and Yellowstone National Parks. His past experience includes environmental education, resource monitoring, and resource management. Phil received a BA in geology from Amherst College and completed the Teton Science School's graduate program after arriving in the Tetons. Phil and his wife, Robin, and two sons live in Jackson. He accompanied JCGA us in 2016 to present it at the uh, Taiwan Car Low Carbon Energy Forum. And as I was mentioning at the top of, the, uh, at the top of our forum, uh, Taiwan is, tai is the capital city um, of Shaanxi, China's largest coal producing province. So in many ways, sort of the Wyoming of China, um, where a lot of the exact same issues are currently being tried to fig figure it out. So uh, without any further ado, Phil, over to you. You can hear me and all is well on your end. You. Great. Um, so again, my name is Phil Cameron and I'm the executive director of Energy Conservation Works based here in Jackson. Um, before we dive off uh, and hear from our uh, wonderful panelists, I did just want to give a nod uh, to the Jackson Hole Center for Global Affairs um, for their amazing ability to bring expert voices together to discuss key issues and to bring partners like us, who are very granular, uh, very localized um, into the conversations, as well as those of you operating in a global scale and context. Um, I hope that the dialogue is in, as informative for everybody else as it has been for me over the course of the day. And I am just always so impressed by Nathan's capacity, um, his father David's capacity, um, his mother Olivia Meg's capacity uh, to effectively facilitate these productive conversations. As Nathan referenced, uh, we were very fortunate in 2016 to travel to Shanxi province to attend and present at the Taiyuan Low Carbon Forum, uh, which was an amazing experience um, in and of itself. But the value I found was in sitting down with municipal leaders to understand what they were doing on energy efficiency, on conservation, on vehicle electrification, and to understand where we had parallels across a very large geographical divide, uh, but at the end of the day, how many commonalities we had. Uh, and then also through opportunities like the Western Governors Association Conference that I attended several years ago with the Jackson Hole Center for Global Affairs, bringing together leaders from throughout the Western states to talk about important energy um, uh, topics, uh, including uh, transportation fuels, energy generation, et cetera, and the ability of the Center for Global Affairs to bring diverse players together to have meaningful conversations. So 
kudos to the Center for Global Affairs. Thank you for inviting us to attend this uh, program today. Um, as many of you noted, hopefully during the opening comments and remarks by Jackson's mayor, uh, Haley Morton Levinson, uh, we have done quite a bit locally. Um, not that we do not have miles to go, um, but um, it's wonderful to hear mayor talking about the steps that the town of Jackson has taken to reduce their energy usage, to reduce their emissions output, and to be a model for the community. Um, to give a little bit more context about Energy Conservation Works' role in supporting a local Wyoming community to be a leader in efficiency and conservation and renewables. Uh, we were created as a public joint powers board and um, through a partnership between the town of Jackson, Teton County, Wyoming, as units of government and our local cooperative electric utility, Lower Valley Energy. And this really grew out of the groundwork and collaboration between those three entities in the early 2000s. As part of that 10 by 10 initiative that Mayor um, Morton Levinson mentioned, um, we had an opportunity to harness a collaborative effort between those agencies and entities, and to also bring in experts in our community to help uh, take that which had been learned and accomplished very much behind the curtain through the 10 by 10 initiative and bring it out more broadly to our community and also to use our greatest lever for change that we are fortunate um, to have here. And that's, that is our iconic status as a destination uh, adjacent to an area of such magnificent ecological importance as the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So uh, through the growth of our partnership, we now serve our public agency partners with funding and executing projects and programs. We serve the business community through um, auditing and financing and do the same for our residents of, of Teton County in the areas served by Lower Valley Energy. So in our small way here on the ground in this particular Wyoming community, we are trying um, to reduce, uh, to use energy more efficiently and to be mindful of our emissions, understanding uh, where our major sources are derived. Um, and in, in our role today, uh, we're going to talk a little bit above my scale and maybe a little bit below the scale at which we have been looking and having conversations today and really focus on, on Wyoming um, as a, you know, in particular ground zero for a changing energy and emissions landscape. And we'll have an opportunity to visit with some, some wonderful panelists. And I just have a few kind of thoughts and comments about this. But I do want to encourage those of you uh, viewing the live stream to take advantage of the uh, chat function uh, to put questions in there. We'll, we'll keep an eye on that over the course of the program. And uh, we will allow time towards the tail end of the program for questions directly from the audience. And it's a great opportunity to get our panelists off script a little bit. So I'm um, looking forward to that. Now, just in framing and moving into our conversation, I would say that today we have very thoroughly covered the on the ground impacts of climate change and risks they pose to our natural resources, those changes we have already seen. That has been clearly and plainly laid out. Um, a key component of our collective necessary response is obviously to reduce emissions through seeking greater efficiencies in our use of energy and in the adoption of emerging and established forms of energy generation that offer lower emission profiles. We understand this. When we focus more explicitly on Wyoming's realities and opportunities to respond to these circumstances in the energy and emissions sector, there are particular challenges that emerge for our small by volume of, of uh, population uh, state. Um, Commissioner Newcomb this morning really well encapsulated uh, what this looks like on the ground uh, for Wyoming communities that rely on mineral extraction uh, through his explanation of Sublet County's budget. And now we can really apply this same reality that most local communities in this state, in fact, 20 out of 22 counties, um, rely um, extensively and principally on revenues from the extractive industries. Um, and these are tied very directly to um, local uh, levels of service um, that are provided to the citizens. Teton County, Wyoming, where we are located, is one of the outliers in that um, our economy is very much tied to natural resources, but in the form of a driving factor behind our tourist-based economy. Uh, Park County uh, is the other that has a similar uh, revenue profile. 
When we think about Wyoming um, and consider the fact that it was the source of roughly 40% of U.S. coal production in 2020, um, there was a marked decline in annual coal production from a peak in the mid-2000s of nearly 467 million tons, uh, down to 267 million tons in 2020. This directly impacts the state's bottom line, our economic realities, and it has impacts most recently, uh, significant impacts on education and social services. And as, as the demand for Wyoming's key products continue to decline, how will we respond? And I think that's what we wanna talk a bit about today is understanding what those influencing factors are and what we can do um, as uh, an energy state in a changing energy climate. So, you know, outside our very well-defined and exceedingly rectangular boundaries, the um, Wyoming faces these, these factors. Um, and with reductions in the, in the revenue from these traditional streams, um, people are going to be affected um, uh, at a very granular level. And we're also, you know, seeing a transition in our traditional employment opportunities and models. So how do we respond? How do we adapt? How does Wyoming capitalize on the shifting energy landscape? Those are some of the questions I hope we'll dig into a little bit with our panelists. And I should say that I'm very fortunate with my, what I would um, characterize as a very fine-grained experience in trying to help this community address its energy sources and, and um, use, um, that I have the expertise of these three wonderful panelists who are going to speak towards the topic of creating a resilient Wyoming. So bringing valuable experience from the investment, academic, and business worlds, I'd like you to join me in welcoming our, our wonderful panel of, uh, featuring Dr. Uh, Robert Godby, uh, Miss Lisa Kitchen, and David Dotson. I'm going to give you a little bit more background on each of the panelists um, so that you can better understand uh, where their experience and expertise lies. And then we'll, we'll jump off into a facilitated conversation uh, with Lisa, uh, Rob, uh, and David. Um, so I'll start with Lisa. Uh, Lisa Kitchen is a vice president and wealth manager uh, at First Republic Investment Management. She began her career in sustainable and responsible investing in 2009 as an ESG, an environment, social, and government governance analyst with progressive asset management an independent, socially responsible investment advisory firm. In 2010, Lisa joined First Republic, where she's helped spearhead the company's socially responsible investment platform. Today, Lisa and her team manage roughly $4 billion in client assets across a range of ESG, impact, and traditional investments. Lisa is a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley, where she received her BA in political economy of industrial societies. In 2020, she was honored as, an, as a top next gen and top women wealth advisor by Forbes. Welcome, Lisa. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, next, I want to introduce you to Dr. Robert Gabby. Uh, Rob serves as the interim dean uh, of the College of Business at the University of Wyoming. He's also an associate professor in the economics department at UW and a Daniel Fields Fund Ethics Initiative faculty fellow and serves as an adjunct faculty member with the MBA program. I'm gonna to have to have you pronounce that um, properly for me, Rob, but the uh, Forzheim University in Germany. Uh, in addition to his academic duties, he was appointed to serve on the state of Wyoming's consensus revenue estimating group in 2019. And his research areas include natural resource, energy and environmental economics, industrial organization and macroeconomic policy and he's often interviewed by the national and international media on energy and macroeconomic issues. Outside of his work, Rob shared that he enjoys spending time being walked by his dogs. And last, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, David Dotson. Uh, Dave is a longtime resident of Wyoming. He grew up in LaPorte, Colorado, just south of Cheyenne, which at the time had a population of less than a thousand people. His dad was in the sugar beet business and his mom was a school teacher. But his family has deep roots in the coal industry, where several generations of Dodsons worked the mines in Western Pennsylvania. Dave worked for Atlantic Richfield Company, the former owners of Arch Coal, and later worked in Texas for a number of energy com companies that included a well servicing company, an electric utility, and a tubular steel manufacturer. He's a graduate of Stanford University, where he received a degree in economics 
and a master's in business administration. And in 2018, he ran for Wyoming's U.S. Senate seat in the Republican primary. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, as you know, as we discussed in advance, we have uh, we have some conversation topics that we'll jump in on, and I think we'll allow um, at the outset, you know, the first question will give each of you an opportunity to um, to share a little bit more about your experience and your expertise on this topic of building a resilient um, uh, future for Wyoming. So, um, starting in on that, let me get my notes back. Excuse me. Um, we're, we're, we're talking about this, um, you know, framing our con conversation around um, a resilient Wyoming. So I would put this to each of you, uh, maybe starting um, with you, Rob, um, to just answer the question and share with us what a resilient Wyoming looks like to you and how you see your work, research, and exper expertise relate to this particular topic in our forum today. So, so thanks a lot, everybody, for being here, uh, and thanks for having me. Uh, so, so what would a a more resilient Wyoming look like? Um, so, I think you know it's really a one-word answer. Um, you know, Wyoming needs to be more diversified. Uh, we've our productive economy is is focused almost entirely on on fossil fuels in terms of. The, sectoral dominance, um, you know, about 25% of the economic value that, you know, Wyoming creates really comes from that energy sector. And, and pretty much all of that energy uh, revenue is, is driven by fossil fuels. But also, more importantly, often is the fact that, you know, our state revenues um, depend on fossil fuels to even a greater extent. Um, at least 50% of the general fund is dependent on, on fossil fuels and, and it can be as high as 70% over the last uh, couple decades. So, you know, what do we need to do? Uh, really to make a more diversified economy is, is, to, is to create an economy that, that actually has uh, greater diversification in it, both in, in what we do and what we produce. Uh, and you mentioned it already, Jackson being kind of the exception is, is a good example of, of where you're doing something different or where the, the economy is dominated by something different. And, and so that's, that's kind of where I would answer the question. And, and of course, you know, we also definitely need to diversify our revenue streams away from, you know, when we have a, an energy cycle, not only does our private economy hurt, but uh, our public finances hurt as well, which, which just worsens the problem. Outstanding. Thank, thank you, Rob. Um, and, and then Lisa, I guess I'd be really curious to hear what you have to say coming um, with your robust uh, investment background, um, where you see a, a resilient Wyoming. What does that look, look like looking forward into the future? Well, I completely agree with what Rob mentioned about diversification um, on, a, on a bigger scale. So what I specialize in is what's called environmental, social, and governance analysis, meaning we essentially apply an environmental and social framework to analyzing publicly traded companies. So with so much of Wyoming's um, economy being driven by fossil fuel industries, um, it's really up to those companies, I think, to either adapt to the changing energy landscape by adopting and, you know, investing more in, in cleaner technologies or adopting their, adapting their current technologies to um, be less carbon intensive. But I think at the core, we need to see a, a very big transition, um, you know, more towards renewables and away from the fossil fuels. Excellent. And then Dave, can, can you please round that out with your thoughts on what a resilient Wyoming looks like to you? I've heard some great, great um, input from each uh, Lisa and Rob, and I'm curious if you have uh, convergent or divergent views on that. No, I think, I think my views are, are converged, certainly. I, I, I would say first, we have to recognize this is an emergency. And uh, the time for sort of PowerPoint presentations are over. And I remember you, may, you mentioned that my family was in the coal business. About 10 years ago, I went and visited the mines where they worked in Western Pennsylvania in the Appalachia region. Those are ghost towns. And because they had their head in the sand and we're running out of time. 
because we can't just snap our fingers and make these transitions that we're talking about today happen. They, take, they don't take years, they take decades. And we have to stop treating this like a partisan issue and not about a bureaucratic planning process and treat it like the emergency that it was or that it is. I mean, we wasted a 25 year head start and we're out of time. The second thing I would say is that we have to shore up our long-term state balance sheet. You know, no one is gonna come rescue us from the other 49 states. And we currently spend about $300 million more than we take in. And the sources of revenue, as Rob pointed out, are going down. And our expenses, as we have the highest, most aging population in the country, are going up. So we have to start thinking about a tax base and an economic base that will make companies want to come here. Because right now, we have an extraordinary, fra extraordinarily fragile state economy. Um, and then we have to figure out what is our spot in the Western state ecosystem? What makes us special about six or 700,000 people here? So we have to be looking at where, our, where we have natural advantages. And then I would say the fourth thing is we need to use the political capital for our benefit. You know, we have some very senior people in Washington, D.C., and I understand that Liz Cheney's lost some of her seniority recently, but we need to insist that those politicians use that platform to help us transition our very small state in terms of population to a different energy world. Because remember, the federal government principally picks winners and losers in the energy sector. And they picked uh, low sulfur coal at one point as a winner, and that put Wyoming on the map in our you know, upper right-hand corner. And then it, the energy, uh, energy policy has changed. And so they do owe us the, the other 49 states do owe us some transition because we've done our part for the last 25 years. But we're never going to get that if we don't have our politicians jumping up and down screaming to support us. So those are really the four things that I, I, I think we need if we want to have a resilient economy. And yeah, David, would you do me um, the honor or would you relist those for me in quick succession? Um, I think that's really yeah, important sure. to hit. First is we have to we have to recognize this is an emergency and we need leadership in our state, both both, you know, at the governor's office all the way through to say that we don't need any more planning. We don't need any more PowerPoint presentations. It's an emergency. The second is that we need to shore up our state balance sheet. Companies are not going to move into the Wyoming when Wyoming is driving their state into bankruptcy and we're uh, under investing in schools, bridges, et cetera. Third is we have to figure out where our spot is in the Western state ecosystem, what we can be good at and where we can win at. And then we have to use our political capital for the advantage of Wyoming. Outstanding, thank you so much. And I guess um, uh, to kind of bounce qu a question back to you and then let the others follow up and answer it on that. Um, within our current landscape in Wyoming and facing the kind of external landscape that we are, what do you see as the biggest um, you know, internal um, challenge and the biggest external challenge to the state of Wyoming right now? Well, the, I mean, I think the biggest external challenge everybody knows, which is coal is going down. And coal is about half, when you, when you add it all up, and Rob will have the numbers at his fingertips more precisely, but it's about half of our state revenue when you take all the things that, that are affected by coal. Coal is going down. We also know that wind and solar are going up. And we do have a natural advantage there. So those are two natural advantages we have. And I'm dying to hear how what Rob and uh, Lisa think about this. But I think natural gas is probably going to go up and down, but over long term is probably going to have a smaller share of our energy uh, uh, energy platform. So so that's the, sort of the, the the energy or the emissions piece of it. Um, and then our biggest factor, and I, I, I'm, I'm circling back to something that I just said was, you know, it's having courageous leadership. And I understand that the, we have a lot of forces in our political system that make us think short term because politicians, they're there because they want to do a good job. They like their job. They enjoy being in public service and they want to get reelected. But we're in an emergency and we need courageous leadership, people who are willing to lose reelection in order to jump up and down and uh, uh, you know what I'm saying. And, and, so, and so that's our internal, uh, you know, the external is what's happening with coal and wind and solar. Um, the internal is that we don't have the leadership that is driving this state in the direction that it needs to. And I remember when I was in Texas in the energy sector, we had a horrible energy boost, uh, uh, bust. And there were uh, 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 
bumper stickers that said, you know, something like, you know, I don't remember exactly the number, but, you know, please, God, give me $60 a, a barrel oil, and I promise not to mess it up this time. You know, we don't have that attitude. I mean, I mean, Texas really rallied around their situation with great leadership, and they diversified their economy. And yes, they're highly dependent on the energy sector, but not like it used to be. That's what we need. We need, we need that kind of sort of Texas leadership here in Wyoming. Right. Thank you. And then, Lisa, I, I would put that same question to you from you from where you sit on it. Um, you know, what's the biggest? You know, what are the biggest internal um, or external factors you play uh, seeing a, a, the role in um, Wyoming's future uh, from an economic basis, at least? Yeah. Well, one thing I would point out is um, we often say in the markets, you know, the stock market leads uh, leads the economy. So, for example, last March we had a big dip in the stock market, and the stock market recovered well ahead of the economy, well ahead of news of a vaccine and well ahead um, of any sort of reopening. So if the markets are any sort of indicator of what's happening to coal or what will happen to the fossil fuel industry, um, the top coal companies in the country have lost anywhere from 50 to 90 percent of their market capitalization over the last 10 years. Um, the S&P 500, which is the 500 largest uh, companies in the United States, uh, is made up of 11 sectors. In 1990, the energy sector was 13% of the S&P 500. Today, it's 2.4% of the S&P 500. So if that shows you anything about how um, the energy sector in, in general has just shrunken from a market capitalization standpoint, um, it's really indicative, indicative that um, those industries are, are quickly going away. Um, and on the flip side of that, uh, you know, all of the investing in the renewables has completely surged. Um, I'm by no means uh, supportive of, of a 700% increase in Tesla last year, but the fact that that single green energy stock was just um, so popular in 2020, I think is really um, a, a representation of what we can expect for more capital to flow into the renewables landscape in the near future. Um, yeah, so externally, I think there's a lot of indicators in the markets that are saying that money is going to continue to flow away from coal and oil and into renewables. Great, well, thank you. Um, and you know, Rob, I would I would see if you have anything to add to that. Um, you know, internally and externally, um, where do you see things uh, forcing our hand? Well. So externally, uh, yeah, the, the greatest challenge has actually not been policy. It's been markets, literally, and their, and their movement away from the commodities that Wyoming produces. We've all talked about coal. Uh, Dave mentioned briefly natural gas. Um, you know, I would argue that natural gas is kind of where coal was, you know, 10 to 12 years ago. It is threatened and it is declining in Wyoming, but it's... It, you know, fossil fuels are threatened across the board. And so, you know, when we have, we talk about the three legs of the resource stool in Wyoming, right? Coal, oil, and natural gas. And, you know, we're a well-diversified state because we produce all three. Um, you know, that's that's really the, the challenge externally is um, the movement away from fossil fuels and the dependence of our economy on it. The, and again, I'll just say this again, the, the greatest challenge internally, um, Dave, really hit the nail on the head. It's going to require leadership. I, you know, probably the scarcest commodity in Wyoming right now is leadership. Um, but what is required is a recognition of what's going on and, and immediately um, looking, you know, recognizing what's going on, saying what it is, and, and taking action. And there are really two actions there. The first is in recognizing what's going on, changing our revenue, uh, model so that it is not so dependent. Um, you know, the the state's budget is actually a source of volatility in the state when in other states, a state budget can be, you know, part of the stabilizing force in the face of volatility. Um, the second thing is looking away from what what's gotten us here to what are the opportunities ahead. Um, we tend to double down if you look at the last legislative session <laughs> Uh, you know, it was kind of like team fossil fuel there. Um, what can we do to prop up these sectors? And we need to look past that. Certainly there, uh, you know, while the wealth is there and, you know, from a state's perspective of self-interest, 
postponing as long as possible the movement away from fossil fuels, at least in the state, actually does a lot for the communities. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, certainly we're, uh, it will increase emissions, and we've heard a lot about that, but we have to look for at our own interests first. And, and so I do think that, you know, trying to postpone that outcome as long as possible, but, you know, it's a finger in the dike sort of outcome. You have to see past that immediate reaction to what you're going to need to do in the future. And to Dave's point, um, recognizing that future, planning for it. And so, you know, if you can use a little bit of time to get ready, all the better. But, you know, those are the two real challenges are, you know, recognizing, well, it's really one challenge, recognizing what the world is uh, doing and, and where it's going. Um, yeah, and it, 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 I, I think about um, in the fall of 2019, uh, when Pacificor announced their uh, update to their integrator, integrator resource plan um, that looked at, you know, out to 2038, I think their plans for managing um, their production uh, as I think the largest um, uh, producer and generator in, you know, the Western states. Um, and they made decisions based on the levelized cost of energy for new generation. Um, and that impact um, that that has on a state like Wyoming, uh, when an entity like Pacificor makes a decision to, um, to go aggressively towards uh, their, their least cost new sources of energy rapidly, uh, decommissioning um, coal plants ahead of their um, planned closures, uh, investing heavily in wind, solar, and storage. And so that was a very, very um, unique inflection point, I think, uh, in Wyoming. I know it it created a lot of um, dialogue at the legislature um, about how to potentially mitigate um, some of uh, those impacts on Wyoming. Um, and I guess I would, you know, put this back, uh, you know, start with you, Rob, to respond. But you know, looking forward, how do you see corporate decision making and or institutional investing um, affecting Wyoming? Or what are our opportunities uh, to harness some of that moving forward? So what's the what are the opportunities? What's the silver lining side? Well, it's it's a tough one. Um, you know, so when we think about moving forward, certainly you mentioned Pacific Corps. Pacific Corps IRP was kind of the wake up call that I think really got everybody everybody's attention. But I remember sitting in, in presentations uh, at uh, the Wyoming Infrastructure Authority, now the Wyoming Energy Authority, uh, at their, they had annual conferences and, and Pacific Corps, I remember them presenting a decade ago what they thought their emissions were going to look like by the mid to end 2030s. And it was this line that went down for carbon and everybody kind of looked at it and stared at it and said, how can that be? Pacific Corps is so dependent on coal. And then it kind of dawned on people in the room, they were going to let the coal plants retire and they weren't planning on reinvesting in them. So, you know, what's happened in 2019 is they just moved those dates up. And, and so to go back to the reality, the reality of the situation is that, you know, Pacific Corps a decade ago realized that they were probably going to be moving away away from coal. And that's really what the rest of the energy sector has done. And of course, Wyoming doesn't rely just on Pacific Core. It relies most of the energy we produce is exported somewhere else, mostly domestically. Um, and, you know, we use so little of our energy that really we don't control our destiny. The destiny is controlled by others that we don't affect, right? Energy users in other states. So, so where does this go? Um, so I think the first thing we have to recognize is that there is a lot of investment in, in say, renewables. But, you know, that brings up a concern. Uh, Dave mentioned that there, there is an opportunity there. So will we just move from one energy source to another? Uh, renewables can't replace fossil fuels. You know, they, fossil fuels, first of all, we had a unique situation. For example, the Powder River Basin, there's no other coal resource like that. But there are wind resources, maybe they're not quite like ours, but they're nearly like ours. And so, you know, we are in competition with other states to, to build renewables. They're not going to automatically come here the way they eventually did for coal. And, and so we have to recognize that, that we have some choices. 
The other thing is renewables are driving, you know, energy scarcity is rapidly becoming a thing of the past in the United States in terms of cost. And, and really the play in, in energy is not to produce energy, it's actually to produce energy when people need it, you know, kind of that um, backup capacity that might be necessary. So if we were to double down on wind, it, it's, for example, it, it's an opportunity, certainly, but it's not gonna replace fossil fuels. And also the value that's created there is going to be much lower than what we've seen in the energy sector in the past. And so really to Dave's point previously and, and to Lisa's as well is, is we have to look out, outwards and, and look at other things and try to figure out where our place is. Um, if, if the answer was simple, we would already know where to go, but, but it's not that simple. Um, we're going to have to really think about things. And one of the big opportunities in Wyoming is to invest in our natural amenities and our, our natural resources in their natural state. And unfortunately, uh, you know, a big move towards renewables, if that's how people keep thinking, creates a big trade-off in that other natural resource, you know, the, the attractiveness that we have to others, which is Wyoming and its natural state. So there, there is a trade-off there. And I guess, so I can't really answer your question of where are capital markets going to take us. I wish I knew. I mean, I do have my, my magic eight ball here. So if you do ask me a couple more questions, I do have the answer. But, um, you know, it won't tell you a lot of detail. Uh, I think really what we need to think about is, is, is the trade-offs we face and really what our preferences are and how important it is to maintain certain things and, and what we're willing to do. And, and the choices will be different in different communities. Um, you know, what we're gonna move towards, I think while, while tourism will probably be one of the biggest sectors Tourism, the larger recreation, leisure economy might be will probably be one of the biggest sectors in Wyoming naturally. Um, what things look like in other places? I don't think you're going to call us an energy economy anymore. It will be very different depending on the local comparative advantages, whether you're in the southeast, the northwest, the northeast, the center, or the southwest. So, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a complicated puzzle, and and there's not a simple answer, and there's also not a uniform answer for the entire state. Great, yeah, no, obviously, um, it is quite a tangled web. Um, and I, I would put a similar question to you, Lisa, based on your experience and expertise with um, uh, the ESG investment world. Um, how do you are you hopeful about how that might encourage Wyoming? Um, uh, to kind of address our economic future, or where do you see that nudging states like Wyoming? Um, and certainly share a little bit more, please, about um, some of the key parameters and even some of the conversation that's ongoing right now um, about the, um, um, is it the, I think that uh, FEC um, is looking at um, a kind of strengthening the ESG reporting requirements and transparency and how you see that playing out. Yeah, I mean, I'd really say there's a revolution happening in the entire investment industry around ESG. This idea before that investing um, to do the right thing meant sacrificing return is basically no longer, it's, it's no longer a, an issue. There's actually a ton of data out there to support the argument that ESG investing or in, investing more with an environmental or, or climate change forward mindset um, really means that you're investing in businesses that are thinking about climate change and thinking about how climate change is going to affect their business plans. Um, so, you know, a, a really simple analogy to understand ESG investing is that every publicly traded company in the U.S. has a credit rating to kind of give a put a put a triple A to C score on the strength of its financials. Um, similar to that. Um, there's ESG data for every single publicly traded company, hundreds of pages of reports of, you know, what is a company's carbon footprint? Do they have emissions targets? Are they meeting the reduction targets? Um, are they thinking about things like water stress and um, how their emissions are disposed of? Um, so there's a whole number of factors that investors are looking at today um, that weren't really be looking, being looked at seriously 10 years ago. So really, the argument that climate change is here and, and investors needs to think about it, I think, is best represented by 
Um, the CEO of BlackRock, Larry Fink, who several years ago came out and said, you know, ESG factors are not material to just investors that are environmentalists. It's, it's, these factors are important to every single investor out there. Um, so I think, you know, in the near term, as you mentioned, we are going to have a move towards SEC mandated reporting of climate change risk because there, there is a material risk to the shareholders of these companies, particularly energy companies um, that might not have a good plan of action in place for, for their business model. Mm-hmm. No, it, it, it is, um, you know, such an interesting time to see how they're trying to um, solidify the reporting on that as a, you know, as a novice in that sector, but to understand how they want to, you know, essentially avoid greenwashing uh, and in kind of provide even greater strength in uh, that ESG reporting, which I think, um, you know, speaks to the interest. I was, um, uh, it was interesting to see the the recent shareholder push within ExxonMobil, right, to um, nudge them to, I think, a net zero by 2040 maybe or, or sooner even, but to see that kind of activist shareholder uh, jumping in and guiding governance uh, so directly. Uh, do you have any thoughts like on, on how that um, is going to play into the landscape moving forward or um, yeah, uh, what kind of volatility that introduces? Um, well, I think people are starting to realize the power of um, their shareholder votes, right? We all have a political vote, but um, we have economic votes in a lot of ways as investors, as consumers, as philanthropists. And so, um, you know, I've, I've met before with a lot of the environmental uh, shareholder activism groups. And, you know, one thing that they told me that's that's very, um, I think, been indicative of how these shareholder resolutions can um, implement change in companies is just simply bringing a resolution to the board, even if it doesn't pass. Um, it's likely to get management's attention. And it's also likely to be on the future uh, votes for the board. And so those types of um, actions by investors, I think, are really prompting uh, senior management of these energy companies to start to pay attention. But um, I've seen a variety of responses. I think some are very open to the changes and some um, just can't really wrap their head around the adaptation. So I think the markets will decide um, who's going to survive and and who will not? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, Dave, I'd be interesting to interested to hear from you on this topic um, of you know either what you see as um, kind of the impact of of corporate institutional investment, and I think also given your background in startup businesses. Uh, and the role you've played in, you know, founding and operating, um, you know, half dozen companies um, uh, in your experience and being part of the startup with so many others. I'd also be curious from your perspective, Dave, to hear kind of what opportunities there are, um, you know, for new business ventures within within our boundaries, even um, if you have anything to say on that. Yeah, no, I um uh, by the way, Lisa, I was fascinated by those statistics about the S&P 500 and the, the energy sector share. And I, that was just fascinating. But to your, to your question, Phil, I, I think it, we could think about it sort of on the standpoint of export and import. And I'm being a little bit loose with those terms. But um, in terms of what we export, which we've been talking a lot about coal for obvious political. And I, you know, Robin said that they, these are market changes. I mean, if there were no such thing as um, uh, climate change, they would still not be building coal fired plants because they don't have the flexibility of a natural gas plant. So they're going to be, if we're going to continue to be an exporter, if you will, is we have to change this mentality of no solution, no one solution is going to solve everything. And I think we've kind of got that embedded in us because we were so spoiled with the Powder River Basin and to a lesser extent oil and gas. Um, And, uh, you know, Rob, you had mentioned how wind is not going to be some panacea, it's going to solve everything. 
thing we have to sort of get over that, don't we? Really, which is that, which is that there's not going to be one solution. There's going to be 25 different sort of on the export side. The last part is we have to change our mentality about the way we give up so much of the value chain industry. But what we're what we do is we grow and we dig up things and we just hand them to other states to add value. And I'll give you an example, which I think is is indicative of how we do everything from you know beef to trona to whatever, is that we have second probably New Zealand the finest wool in the world, not in America, in the world. And what do we do? It has to do with our climate and, and, and the dryness in the, in the state. What do we do? We shear the sheep and we give it to somebody else. And so we get a very small part of the value chain and we let North Carolina build the suits or the same thing with our beef industry. We get very small part of the value chain in Colorado where most of the value is actually created before it ends up on somebody's plate. And so we've got to change that mentality of seizing more of the value chain because we don't have that many mouths to feed here in Wyoming, only six, 700,000 people. So we can get a lot done with what we have. And then the other side from the act, that's sort of on the export side, from the import side, you know, we have to make Wyoming a place that businesses and corporations want to move into. And we can be conservative, but we don't have to be unwelcoming. And sometimes I think we're unwelcoming in a lot of the ways that we treat the rest of the, the rest of the country. And you take a place like Cheyenne, I'm just picking Cheyenne as an example. Cheyenne is 30 minutes further from London than Cherry Creek. Okay, it's just a little bit further to the Denver airport. Cheyenne is across the border. It's got a better tax rate. Cowboy is cool these days. A great natural resources if you want to ski, if you want to fish, if you want to hunt, all those kinds of things. But look at the downtown. 20% of Cheyenne's downtown is boarded up. So if we're going to try to attract businesses and companies, whether they're small businesses and big ones, we got to start dressing ourselves up a little bit if we want to import businesses into our economy. No, that, that's really interesting, especially that, that notion of not just exporting our product, but exporting our ranking on the supply chain and value chain, I think is an important thing to, to think about is how do we move our way up that chain over time. Um, so that the wool example was one that I hadn't heard ex explained before. So thank you for that. Um, and let's bounce back over. So, you know, Rob, you actually spoke to this a little while ago um, that we're not always going to be the energy state um, or we're going to be a different energy state than we have been for a long time. Uh, but there is a lot of discussion. We had a note to talk about this. It's come across um, as a question in, in our comments here, but there's been a lot of discussion about um, um, advances, you know, whether it's in renewables, whether it's in the commercialization and scaling of the carbon capture, or most recently, small scale nuclear generation within our state. So I'll throw this one back to Rob, and then we can hear um, from from Dave and then Lisa. Uh, but, you know, in that suite of options, and probably I think people have the most questions about the most recent um, topic being discussed, but is that that small scale nuclear generation, uh, the Gates partnered project uh, that's being discussed as possibly situated in Wyoming. Tell us a little bit more about how you see that fits into our puzzle and what opportunity that presents for the state. So, again, Wyoming is a, is a, a bunch of communities. So, you know, Dave mentioned Cheyenne, um, and clearly that nuclear project, if it comes to pass and it were successful, and there's a lot of ifs in that chain, by the way, um, it will impact a local community, but broadly speaking, um, and, I, and I just wanna pick up on, on what Dave said, and the fact that there is a unique opportunity here, uh, you know, the outcome of COVID is a significant amount of federal funds for reinvestment. A year ago, we were trying to figure out what we were gonna do, and we thought we were broke. Turns out we, you know, with the rebound in markets, uh, we weren't as broke as long as we thought we were, but still, we were facing the future and we were on the edge of a cliff. And we didn't really have a lifeline here. Um, we have one right now. And so, you know, if you talk about the infrastructure uh, agreement that appears to have been made today in Congress, um, we really need to rebuild an infrastructure. I mean, you heard it a little bit on Dave's connection. 
first of all, we need broadband. We need better broadband. We need to connect our communities. I mean, the big areas the you know, the, the larger by Wyoming standard cities um, are okay, but you get outside of them and you immediately run into these problems and a modern economy is going to be connected. And so if you're not connected in Wyoming, you're going to be left behind. And there might be a few people that want to hide out, but the rest of the economy is going to go on and that's really not going to help people. And secondly, to Dave's point, we do really have to reinvest. It's not just dressing up. It's really making sure that we have the social infrastructure, the physical infrastructure that's necessary to make sure that we're as competitive as possible. Um, and then you look at, at some of the opportunities and there's different opportunities in different places. So, so this, this nuclear announcement that was made, um, it is both, you know, it's, it's certainly, uh, a, a, for some people, kind of a breath of fresh air, new news where somebody is talking about a big new something that gives people hope. Uh, theoretically speaking, it could, you know, they're talking about putting nuclear reactor uh, technology it basically in existing places like a, a coal-fired power plant. Um, so what does that do? Well, locally, it preserves the local tax base, which keeps more wealth in the economy, um, supports it, and secondly, it could preserve those high value jobs. So those are the potential positives. Uh, it creates that um, local economic activity. Of course, it's not gonna replace all of those exports that Dave talked about. It's really gonna be a local effect. It may use a little bit of the uranium in the state, but of course it gets refined somewhere else. And there's a lot of ifs there. Nuclear power has yet to be proven to be cheap. And in the world of renewables, you are going to need to provide energy at very low cost. And so one of the questions, whether it's CCS or whether it's nuclear, um, is really, first of all, can you compete with the existing environment, which is lower and lower energy prices that are being driven down by renewables? Um, the second is, you know, how much value will that create? And, uh, you know, I'm not even going to get into the fact that, you know, what was proposed in that, uh, you know, there's a lot of questions, um, but in order to work out, it's going to have to be competitive. And, and we don't know if that's going to be the case, whether it's CCS or nuclear. Um, and of course, you know, there are a lot of other ifs that don't get talked about a lot. You know, sodium reactors are not proven. Um, there's a lot of flexibility in the design they're talking about. Um, and so not to throw water on it, but, you know, that's that's kind of a big idea. And I'm really glad to hear that we're talking about big ideas in Wyoming that are different. Um, but we've got to be careful and we can't, again, just throw our eggs in one basket and think, there it is. That's the, the secret. Um, it's going to be a lot of little things. And so to Dave's point, we've got to be ready to welcome opportunity when it comes. And what are the essential ingredients to make sure that? Uh, it's to have a healthy looking economy, local economy, which Dave already mentioned. It's also that you've got the critical infrastructure that's necessary. And, you know, I, I've already spoken about broadband. And so those are investments that just need, need to be made. And we have an opportunity to do it with these federal funds that are one time that could do that. Now, Lisa, uh, from your perspective um, uh, in the investment world, um, whether it is, um, ESG funds um, or other institutional investments. Do you see um, this small-scale nuclear um, as a as a an attractive opportunity um, for investments in energy generating states and places like Wyoming? Well, what I would say in general is that I've I've heard from lots of um, climate climate specialists that we will not reach a net, a net zero emissions. Um, world without nuclear. Um, you know, the idea of renewables is great, but particularly, I guess I'm thinking of, you know, economies like in Asia, emerging markets, 100% um, renewables is they're on a pathway, but I, I don't think we'll get there without nuclear. Um, but I'm going to actually pivot and, and maybe uh, <laughs> go to another, another big idea, as Rob would call it. And I, I guess, you know, one thing that I've heard in conversations, at least uh, directly from investors and some um, business owners from out of state is that there seems to be interest in a technology opportunity in Wyoming. Um, there are these conferences happening like every fall now there's a, a global technology summit 
Um, I've spoken with um, CEOs from Silicon Valley tech companies who have been interested in, in building some sort of infrastructure in Wyoming, um, ironically, because of the lower energy costs versus states like California. Um, so I do think that we potentially um, do have some opportunity opportunity to diversify into other areas uh, from energy, um, you know, such as technology. Great. Um, I like the big ideas thread and I'll kind of carry that through to, uh, um, to you, Dave. Um, in that topic of, of big ideas, obviously it seems well established in the conversation that not putting our eggs in one basket, um, um, not trying to maintain our um, status quo um, by plugging the next thing directly in. But what do you see as, as opportunistic uh, new and, and big ideas uh, that Wyoming can jump on? And I'll let you answer that. And then I'll just let everybody know that um, we're going to wrap up with one final question and a quick response from each speaker. Um, but uh, we are closing in on about five minutes left in our session. So um, Dave, if you want to jump on that, talk to us about your big ideas. Sure. I, my big idea is to stop thinking about big ideas. I think <laughs> we need to realize this is a game of inches. And when I think about the nuclear plant, and uh, I, Rob's the expert on this, not me, but I do know this, is that if, if they build that plant and it brings a few hundred jobs to Kemmerer, that's exactly the kind of thing we need. And we need to start thinking about 50 jobs and 100 jobs and 250 jobs. There's no, there's no, there's no magic golden key that is gonna be like the Powder River Basin that is gonna bail us out of this. And that's why I, I think we, we have to stop thinking about that. I think the ideas that Lisa had about the, uh, the, the, the tech in, industry and, 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 and those opportunities uh, because of our lower energy costs, that's fine. That's not gonna change anything, but that's gonna keep nudging it forward. Um, the thing that I would say that we have to be careful about is thinking about things like carbon capture and because carbon capture is just hanging on to the dream. Um, the, the amount of money that you know, Tundra has got the carbon capture um, plan in, Wyoming, in Montana, you know, with the subsidies, that's a four, four, four and a half billion dollar project. And Congress just approved 500 million. And by the way, we pull in the four years it's going to take to get Tundra, the carbon capture uh, project up, we're going to have, we're going to lose 27 equivalents of that in terms of retirements of coal plants. So we have to stop thinking about that there's any chance, any chance at all, that some, some magic thing is going to come in and save coal. It's not going to save coal. And then the last thing I'll say is this, it's really about jobs. Because what we want to do is we want to have an economy where people can wake up and they can go and they can earn a decent living and go back home and spend time with their family and do the same thing in the next day. And so when we're thinking about, you know, we got addicted to coal royalties because we thought an economy is cashing checks. This is not going to be about mailbox money. This is going to be about creating jobs and opportunities so people will stay in Wyoming and they'll go to work and they'll go home at night and do it all over again. It's 50 jobs here, 100 jobs there, 75 jobs there. So less about big ideas, more ideas, and new ideas are critical. Um, I, I like that. Uh, and, you know, I think at this point, what I would say is before I get the hook from, um, from Nathan, uh, I just wanted to give the three of you, um, extend my appreciation uh, for joining us and bringing in your very um, well-versed and, and unique perspectives on, on the topic. And I wanted to give each of you just a quick parting shot. So... 30 to 60 seconds, you have an audience right now. What's the one kernel you want to leave those viewing the forum now or in the future um, in its recorded form? What's your parting shot, Rob? So I guess what I would say is, is you know, if, if there's one thing that we could do to build more resilience in Wyoming, it would be to support that leadership that thinks about change and embraces change. Um, it's all too easy to resist change, uh, to you know, worry about your taxes going up and, and, that, and not look at the big picture. Um, so I, I would say that the big idea here is to really, it's, it's hard. You know, it's natural that people are afraid of change, but we have to accept change and embrace change and 
look for the opportunity in it and support those people who are willing to look at new ideas as opposed to hanging on to the old ones. That's what I think is fundamentally, if, if, if we could get more of that in the state, that's the first step. All right, so be the change. Okay, um, Lisa, what do you think? Well, I feel like I've created my entire career around um, really putting meaning to money and investing and spending in a conscious way. And so it's maybe a little less direct, but I think every person has an opportunity, whether you have investments or you're a consumer, to just spend in a way that, that really resonates with your values. And so if you are fortunate enough to have investment capital, whether it's through your employer or a 401k or 403, 403b or um, you know personal investments and you work with someone, ask about the ESG investments. Let's Let's keep pushing this this um, this movement forward um, and really uh, speak to the big corporations about um, really recognizing climate change and how uh, they need to be thinking about climate change in the way that they're running their businesses. Oh, that's great. So intentional spending, I like that. Uh, and then Dave, take us home. What's your what's your quick parting shot? Your kernel. I'm I'm just gonna I'm just gonna close the circle on my original comment. We have an emergency, and we have to start recognizing this as an emergency. You do not pivot a state economy in years. You pivot it in terms of decades, and we've pissed away 25 years, and if we don't start treating this like the emergency it is, we are going to be so sorry that we squandered this. So that it is time for action. Um, great. Okay. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, it was fun to visit with you. I hope we can do this another time in person. Um, and I just want to um, say thank you uh, to the Jackson Hole Center for Global Affairs as well. I think Nathan is going to be taking back the reins in a minute um, uh, to have his take his closing remarks on. But, you know, until that time, um, I am happy to um, um, share actually a little bit more about our local impact um, through energy conservation works and in some of the ways that relate back to what I think is resilience in the community uh, and how you know we have a specific example of our partnership with the now Wyoming Energy Authority, um, but we have a 10-year relationship with the state um, that provides us with the necessary capital to invest in efficiency in the in the homes of Wyoming residents. Um, so I think that was that's one you know great example um, that we have been able to from our position in this community as a little bit of an outlier in this traditional you know energy state, we've been able to find common ground uh, with our partners at the state that ultimately helps the um, you know the individual citizen here in Wyoming, and that supports conservation and efficiency projects in their homes. Um, it allows them to put renewable generation on their roofs. Uh, and it helps them do that and pay for it with their savings one month at a time on the power bill. So that was, uh, you know, one example that we had on a very small scale of supporting resilience here. And I do think it is an interesting thing to think about when we talk about energy and we talk about um, that landscape. We are most often um, captivated by new generation. Uh, and we also have an opportunity to remember that the cheapest and cleanest unit of energy is the one we don't use. And so that would be, I think, my parting shot is that um, it is really important um, to be intentional about our energy use and recognize that um, at the point of use, we have a tremendous amount of control on that. So um, that would be my parting shot. Uh, on behalf of Energy Conservation Works, thanks again to the Jackson Hole Center for Global Affairs, David, Rob, Lisa, thank you for your time. And I think we'll hand things back over.